catfish whiskers. I never did know. <laughs> so this is my first time to go through one. I didn't get an introduction, so I just come on up. Uh, if anybody don't know who I am, talk to me at a church. Some of us have been here in this church quite some time. I remember very much when you could get 35 in preaching down at the old church, that was a crowd. Mr. Joe Castle said if you get 50, he'd sing a song. I'll never forget that. They got 50, he sung a song. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And then he was dead in a short while. Remember that, Vernon? And I thought about that many times. And now look at it today and how it's prospered. And, uh, it didn't come this way easy. If you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Alden mentioned to me Wednesday night that I want 10 minutes to do this deacon denomination. I said, all right. I didn't tell him nobody gets 10 minutes of my time. If you want to use 30, that's all right. We'll just be here a while. I've had people get up and walk out before at 12 o'clock and say, this is enough. You may not believe that. I preached in a church not long ago. Preaching started at 10 o'clock. I got up and said, this is the first time I've been in a church where you had two hours to preach. I thought the sound man was going to fall out of the balcony. He said, we didn't tell him. No. <laughs> but they get out at 11 to go eat. And, uh, but I used to be different before I got a little age on me. I guess at one time I could sweat, spit, stomp, find out nobody was listening to me, and I quit. And so I did learn real early that my responsibility to the church was to teach, preach God's Word. And if I had it to do over again, knowing what I know now, I probably would never preach a topical sermon. It would be expository preaching of the Word. That's what's important because it's growth. So as we look at uh, what I want to talk to you tonight about is church Christian growth, I should say. I've had people in church that I've pastored, so I've been saved 50 years. You would think by their spirituality they'd been saved two weeks. They never grew. They didn't know anything. They'd come to church regular, but that was it. They never progressed. And to be a happy Christian, you've got to progress in that of what Christianity is about. And we're going to see tonight what it's about. So Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But if a man think of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself, but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth in his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth in the spirit shall of the spirit uh, reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them that are in the household of faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this another day that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you give us of those things that we don't even ask for, those things that not necessarily dis sustain life, but that we may enjoy life. We thank you for the church. Thank you, Lord, for people that make up the church. We ask, Lord, you'll bless tonight each and every one. And we pray, Lord, for those that are going through that of a burdensome time tonight, all uh, with loss of love and maybe other needs in their lives. Maybe that need may be a physical life, a, a burden. It may be a financial burden. Lord, we uh, want to look in your word tonight to see that uh, burdens can be uh, lifted through you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we 
a look here in this text, and I have had people through these years say, well, I have found contradiction in God's word. And this would be one of the places they would say. It says, every man shall bear his own burden. Then a little farther down, he says that we should bear one another's burden. Well, what do we do? How do you answer people like that? I answered him in the same way that one man said to me, that everyone shall work out his own salvation. I said, that's not in the Bible. He couldn't read and write. He went home, got his wife to look it up, brought it back and showed me. I said, yeah. He said, what does it mean then if salvation is not a work? I said, it really should be work out your salvation. If you have salvation within you, work it out for Jesus Christ doing his work to other people. And that's what it means. The Bible doesn't contradict itself anywhere, and not even here tonight, and we're going to see. Now, the great need of the church today, as I uh, said probably earlier, is uh, that of the we bear one another's burdens. I've heard burdens of people for many years now. I, being in the position of a pastor, have seen many people with varied burdens, for many years, it was almost every day that I dealt with people that was heavy-hearted, burdened. Life didn't mean anything to them. And I also think many times of I'd go visit my mother, and she had to know about everybody, their condition. One's in the hospital, one's in the rest home, one's that was going through all kind of trouble. I said, Mother, I come to talk to somebody that don't have a problem. I just like to fellowship with people that don't have to tell me all of their trouble. And she kind of called, I quit doing that so much. But I realized the sharing burdens with the past, that comes with the calling. You have uh, people that's going to always have burdens, and you're in a position to help sometimes, many times with trouble. But knowing the condition and reason a certain scripture was written makes it a little easier here to understand this. Paul in the second verse here says, Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The church at Galatia had been trying to keep the heavy burden of the Mosaic law, of the moral law, and yet they were Christian. And they were trying to earn salvation, we could say. They put themselves back under legalism, and they had forsaken the gospel way. In other words, do both and be sure of heaven. Uh, justify, justification by faith is not enough. Well, what is a legalist Christian? I've said that a lot. I've told it to other people. Well, I've had a few run-ins with legal Christians. There are those people, and trust me, I know some, and I've had to, that will drink a Coca-Cola out of a glass, but wouldn't dare drink it out of a bottle. <laughs> That's legalism. I can tell you a preacher's wife, but he won't let her drink a Coke out of a bottle. Well, what? Somebody might think it's something else. It's really silly to be legalistic that way, and many other things that people are trying to do. Now Paul said, all right, you want a law, you want a burden, you want to live under a burden, you wish you were under a law. Well, he says you are. You are bought for the price. You are not your own. Uh, you, under the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Luke 10, 27 says, love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the law. That's what you're supposed to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, love. And if you don't love people, then there's something wrong with your profession of being a Christian. Now, it seems we always want more information about God's word than we're going to get. Well, we've got all we're going to get. This is all we need. But the thing we must understand Christians must love one another. I love everybody. And one person in the church says, well, I don't know if you do or not. I said, yeah, 
You'll get one chance at me. The second time won't be unto me. You don't get the second chance, but I still love you. And I won't go into that. Now, William, General William Booth, you know, he was a founder of the Salvation Army. He was getting up in years. They had their convention, and he couldn't attend. So he cabled the delegates to the convention. And the one that was moderating the convention says, we have a telegram from General Booth to this congregation. And everybody wondered, what has he got to say? He gave them one word in that telegram, others. That's all there was to it. It's about others. It's not about me. It's not about you. Uh, it's about others. Others of God's children. In the popular comic strip of Peanuts, you know, we used to read that. I don't see it much now. But Lucy said to Charlie Brown, why are we here on earth? We probably asked ourselves that question or others. And his reply was, to make other people happy. Well, the reply came back, then why are others here? Why are they here? I have to watch myself. I get opinionated sometimes. Seems to me that I know more people that are recipients of others than those that do. I have to watch this because I don't have much use for people that won't work when they're able-bodied and living off of the system. And I know a lot of those. And so I have to be careful what I say and even how I feel. One another is a key phrase in the Christian vocabulary. Love one another is found at least 12 times in the New Testament, but we'll uh, remind ourselves of two or three. Paul, uh, James said, pray for one another. First Thessalonians, Paul wrote to edify one another. And to the church at Rome, he said, prefer one another. Well, it's hard for me to prefer people that I think is important more than me. And you feel the same way, you just don't admit it. That, you know, you feel like, well, and nobody's important to me. We're not to make Scripture mean something here that it does not. But Paul was not predict uh, contradicting himself here uh, in verse 5. Uh, he would be if he was talking about literal burdens. Now, we know what burdens are. You know, my burden's a lot worse than yours. We can have the same thing bothering us. But mine's a lot worse. You ought to have some of my burdens, I tell you, and you have the same one. It don't bother me, as I told Tim once, he asked me, he says, about surgery. Do you go to the hospital when people have minor surgery? I said, all surgery on other people is minor. To me, it's major. <laughs> same thing. So that's just the way I've always been. So uh, that's my attitude. But verse 2, he was talking about that of physical burdens, like a, beat, a burst of, uh, beast of burden in an animal that would carry a load. And I know Greek language means nothing to you. It didn't mean anything to me. And as I was able to tell a Sunday school class last week, who would have ever thought when I surrendered to preach that I would have studied the Greek language. I'd heard preachers say all my life in Revelation when John said, I, Jesus told to John, said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nobody never told me that that's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. Everything in between. But I had to learn a little for one reason, not to teach people Greek, but to really understand what these words say and here in verse 2, the word is baros. It could mean many things, but it means a burden on the outside. A burden that's out of our body. A burden that, uh, it could mean maybe not having enough food. Maybe it could mean 
not having a car. Maybe it could mean even sickness to a certain extent or health problems. Maybe it could be even earning a living. That's the word burden means here in verse 2. But in verse 5, he uses another word, barathon. And that's something born of. Referring to a weight, fault, refers to spirituality of a Christian, of uh, the church, the Christian church, the only army in the world, you know, the Marines, uh, advertise they never leave one behind. They always take care of their own, their dead. But what does a Christian church do? If you find one, that of one of these soldiers crippled, everybody jump on him and make him more miserable. Beat him down. The church does that many, many times and make his burden a lot worse. The church is the only organization or the only army, I should say, that kill their wounded. I don't know if you noticed, Brother Williams, this morning, closely the words he was saying. He's a burden preacher. He put his life into the gospel ministry. And maybe you picked up on some what Stuart had said. He's had his burdens the last few months. Why? Because of the way the church treated him. He can't retaliate. I tell young preachers all the time when there's problems in a church, don't retaliate. You're going to lose. They'll tell you right quick, we're here before you come, and we'll be here when you leave. That's the way the Christian army is, I'm afraid. Now as we look first here on buying you one, of, uh, one another's burdens, what does it mean? To many of the Christians says, you help me and I'll help you. Not if you will, just do it. Many times as a Christian. And as my dad used to say, and he quoted that scripture, doing good to people that didn't do good to us, and I'd retaliate and say, remember how they done? He said, yes, son, but we're going to heap coals of fire up on our head. Do good to those that mistreat you. If you really want to hurt someone, I can tell you a story, and I won't cause a family of years ago, and a man said, I really got him told I was about to give him a whipping, and when he got, when I got through on him, he said, how about you and your wife come to my house for supper tonight? And he said, we win. <laughs> See, that, that's the way the Christians are supposed to react to these problems. Now, first we deal negatively here. What does it mean to bear one another's burdens as some do? Often I'm afraid someone has a burden, someone has a misfortune, and if we are opinionated real quick, we'll say, well, he's committed some kind of sin, and God is punishing him. I looked at Brother Steve, and I thought on this. If he was to fall and break his leg, I'd say, well, he's done something, and God's punishing him. But if I fall and break my leg, the devil's really after me. <laughs> now, that's the way we do, Steve. <laughs> you know, if it's happened to me, it's the devil doing it. If it's happened to you, you're not doing too good, and God's done it. So well, that's the way we operate sometimes. There's some whose religion consists of laying uh, really heavy burdens on other people uh, with legalism, as we mentioned. The countenance, maybe, you can tell, by the way, and Jesus had something to say about that. The text does not mean we are to spy out other people's fault. That's the subject of verse 1. Notice verse 1. Brethren, if a uh, man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. That's our obligation. How often we do that. How often in the church have I seen and you've seen a brother or sister fall and then, well, we'll just help the Lord punish him. We'll jump on him. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Paul is telling these people at Galatia. That's what they were doing. They were jumping on those that weren't able to take care of themselves. There are some religions some people we might say that consider
consist of just laying burdens upon other shoulders. The text does not mean we're to really find fault with one another. To a Christian, a fault is a burden. Uh, we need to strive for perfection as a Christian. How often have you said to others, he or she is a good person, but then we continue to tell what's the matter with them. We stop there, and no more needs to be said. Uh, why do we do that? Well, I know why I've done it. I'm afraid if I say something good about them, their star is going to overshadow mine, and people won't know what I've done. <laughs> That's the way you do, too. Stop before you let that person overshadow you with the good that they may have. The carnal believer thrives upon spiritual dictatorship, dominating other Christians. John Wesley was running a revival in a church once. And a man came to him three different times and said, Preacher Wesley, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with that dead church. And he proceeded to tell what was wrong with the different people. And Preacher Wesley said, why do you do that? Why do you say that? And this man had one of the problems that the church at Corinth had. He said, I have the rare gift of discernment. I can tell what's the matter with you. The Lord gave me that gift. I can just pick out trouble people. John Wesley said, well, let me tell you about that discerning spirit. You know, people of Corinth had that. Some Baptist churches had it too. But he says, this gift you have, and everybody has one gift, you say that's your gift, you take it and wrap it in an napkin, and you bury it. When you get before the Lord, he's not going to ask you what you've done with that gift. He's not concerned about your discernment of other people. You won't ever need it anymore, he said. Now, I believe there's great wisdom in the advice he gave him. There's still uh, some that only uh, have the gift of spying out others' faults. If there's a burden in that of another's life, what would I say to you? Shut your eyes, bow your knees, and do more than just pray, but do what you can physically to help with that baritone burden. Help them in any way you can. Now further, the text does not mean that we're to despise those that have a burden to bear. And this is another place we have to watch as a Christian. Maybe of poverty, of physically, and the mentally afflicted. You know, sometimes we get put out with people that don't have intelligence, maybe, that we have. And one church I pastored, and some of you were there, we leased the bottom of the church to the mental, mentally people in the state, the state health department. And I, got, I was their pastor, about 40 of them. And it was easy for me to say, well, why don't you learn? Can't you see? I didn't stop to realize it's only by the grace of God that I wasn't there. And we forget that sometimes when people are not as mentally capable as we think we are maybe at some time or another. Uh, we need to... Uh, Take notice of that. Now, let's look here in these closing moments at the positive side of bearing burdens. I believe that we are to have great compassion upon those who have to bear a great burden. And I pray in my private prayers, Lord, help me to have compassion on those people that you chose not to bless the day like you blessed me. You know, it's very easy for me to say, well, you get what you deserve. But for whatever reason the Lord chooses to bless me above that person, 
I don't want to ever forget that it's through his love and his grace that he blessed me. I believe if we to have that compassion on everyone. Not long ago I was in a meeting for a lot of men. I don't remember exactly where it was at. Someone had killed a policeman. You know, that pretty much an everyday thing. And people were discussing what ought to happen to the one that committed this crime. One wise man says, let me tell you fellas, huh? there's two families hurting there. There's two people, two families that got a very big burden tonight. It's easy to dislike the one that committed the crime in that family. But that's not what Paul is saying here we should do. So we need to be careful. Those that have the burden of sin, we're to love them to Christ. It is the only way. In fact, the church I pastored, oh, oh, too far. I thought about this many, many times. I was, had an answer for everything, about half scared to death. Come out of the church, the chairman of the board of deacons, he went sending up smoke signals. He lit it up. I think he was telling the other church that that preacher ain't no good. I couldn't read his smoke signals. But his wife was so embarrassed, she said, Preacher, get on him. Make him stop. That's all she could say. And my quick reply was, Lady, I used to smoke, and nobody ever made me mad enough to quit. And I don't care what your sin is, you won't make that person mad enough to quit. Dr. Sheely tried it on me. Tried to embarrass me to death when I smoked. He went and told Lance. Said, that Tommy's is burning one cigarette right after another. Next time, I, he felt like he quit, but he didn't. Next time I seen him, he had one. But I quit. But he, he, he didn't make me mad enough to quit. He tried to. you got to make up your own mind when you're going to quit anything uh, in your life. Now, the text seems to mean be very patient with the infirmities of others. And we might say, oh, but so-and-so has a bad temper. They're hard to love. Yes, we can find faults with all people. But that's not what he's telling us. They have the bitterness in their heart. If they have, I hope it's a burden to them, too, if they have that burden. Uh, I think bearing one another's burdens also means in time of sorrow. In times of what many have gone through, even this last few days in this church, where that hurt inside, and I've said it many funerals, there's that burden, that hurt, that I wish I had a pill to give you, and your burdens would be lifted. Your troubles would be over. I don't have that. We're to have compassion, we're to have love for those people with a burden of losing that of one that's so dear to him. Verse 5 shows that everyone that must bear his own what? Responsibility. I worked at several textile plants. Worked at foster plant, and that's all I want to tell you. I don't know the man's name. He's going to be with the Lord now. A lot of you would know him at work there. Come out of work one day and it's hot about like it was today, and he parked beside a lady and she had a flat tire. He just got in the car and drove off. I changed the tire. The next day, I got on him. I said, what do you mean driving by off and leaving that woman there with a flat tire? Let me tell you something, preacher. If God meant for us to ride, he'd have to put wheels on How do you answer that? i tell you how I answered it. That very day as the Lord would have it. I like to call his name. I already sat with a flat tire. I said, if the Lord meant for us to ride, he'd put wheels on us. And I drove off and left him. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to be careful how we, what we say about others' burdens. You cannot be saved by prophecy, meaning your family, your children, people that you know. But I'm responsible for preaching the gospel. 
and how I've been for a number of years. I'm not responsible for people's reception of it. I felt like I was sometimes. But you must bear your own burden of sin, your own burdens in life, but by self-examination, by personal service, it's not by the words that we say as we witness to the lost, but it's by the works of the law of love that we witness to that person. More effective. Very few people that I know have ever go down the road, knock on doors, say you lost or you or you want to be saved. They won't do. You got to show them that you love them first. When you show them you love them, then you'll get response. Now, in the conclusion here, you may not have understood much I've said tonight. As you get older, you forget it's about all it works. And my dad-in-law said, Tommy, when you get 80, you can say anything you want to. They'll say, that old man's mind getting bad. Ain't he? <laughs> so you get by with saying most anything. But anyway, uh, all that I've said, believe this, Jesus Christ is the greatest burden bearer that you will ever uh, know. We sang the song, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Maybe you're here tonight and your burden is the original sin of unbelief. Maybe you're under conviction of it, we might say. But you don't have to carry that burden to eternity. You don't have to carry it alone. And I say to you tonight, maybe you're here with some type burden. And are you going to leave with the same burden you brought to church with? And some of you have burdens. I can tell by looking at you. You have a countenance of something inner being of me that's bothering me greatly, and it's a burden. And I can't hide it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Maybe you have a lost friend, a lost family member, a lost neighbor or someone. Maybe your burden may be some unconfessed sin. Maybe your burden is a backslidden condition. Maybe your burden is about service that you need to be doing for the Lord. Maybe it's something He wants you to do. And it's burden. I know that burden. And it makes life miserable. The Lord wants you to do something and you say, I can handle this by myself. That won't help. And lastly, the last question could be that you're not burdened at all about anything or anybody. You just don't care. That's very easy to do also. As we have that of the organist piano song to play the invitation, I do invitations, I guess, different for other people. I know I do different for Stuart. He does his way. I do mine. The Lord speaks to people privately and publicly. If everyone will stand, and you don't have to bow your head or close your eyes. You can just look and examine your own heart. And I'll be down.